Hey everyone, hope you're having a good day. My name's Andy, my channel's Finding Value. Uh, today we're gonna go through Twitter, see what people are sharing on social media. It's generally related to three different topics, financial topics, commodities, uh, and or wealth building. Uh, so let's dive in here, let's take a look and see what people are talking about and sharing on social media. Uh, if you wanna follow me, it's at finding underscore finance. And if you wanna join our community, finding-value.com, that's where we go into individual companies, individual stocks. We talk about market conditions. What do the inverted yield curve mean? Where are we at in the business cycle? We go over all of those things. Uh, if that interests you, use the word discount in the coupon code and, and join us. We're coming on down, new inflationary pressures building up here in the Suez Canal. Transit volume continues to plunge. Ha, look at that, guys. We are way down there. 2,645,162 compared to stuff that's over 5.1 million. So the volume has really pulled back and this could be a contributor to inflationary pressures. Uh, freezing weather is knocking out millions of barrels of US oil output, uh, according to Bloomberg. So this big cold uh, weather spell that the United States has experienced and is experiencing, depending on where you're at, is knocking out production of natural gas and oil. And some of it's quite substantial. Uh, we're talking millions of barrels per day. <laughs> and I think it could have an impact on the price of oil. Um, so talking about this, and this won't show that impact, but U.S. commercial crude oil plus the big three product inventories, uh, what he says is it's not low enough, but we're pretty low. I mean, we're below the five-year average. Uh, we are above 2023, uh, and there we are in 2024, but we are going to see perhaps a move lower in inventories once this weather gets accounted for in the inventory level. So we'll probably see it this week or next week. Uh, this week for sure, and probably the week after, is we'll see this pull on down here for inventory. Uh, this analysis is great on the surface, but does not align with producer behavior. And what this guy's looking at is he's saying uh, $5 plus or minus 50 cents is likely to be the marginal cost of production in the Haynesville, depending on location, meaning $6 will be the price necessary to increase the Haynesville production as tier one locations are run down. Below is a 10% internal rate of return scenario. This is for natural gas. This is the Haynesville internal rate of return by natural gas price. And the percentage of total Haynesville evaluated area, not profitable at $2 uh, per million BTU. Uh, there's $4, we've got $6 and then uh, $8. And it's not as profitable going lower, it's more profitable as you go up. This is the percentage of the total Haynesville evaluated. So if you were to look at this and you were to go like 50% mark, marginally not profitable at all is this line going across. And as you go through the field, you're gonna need higher and higher uh, pricing for internal rate of return. So you're gonna have to do something like a 6% if you're roughly at the 50th percentile, you need $6 MMBTU to really turn on that field is what they're saying. And we're down here in the twos and threes for MMBTU, which you're basically below the cost curve of the Haynesville of where they have drilled today. So I would, I would expect, and I think a lot of people expect higher natural gas prices, but he's saying, this analysis is great, but on the surface, it doesn't align with what producers are actually doing. They're still producing, trying to, even though there might be producing at a loss. Uh, $2,000 passively while sleeping is much better than $6,000 working 40 plus hours. Do you agree? I don't, I look at all this as, you're building a portfolio and your, your savings from your working job to increase your passive income. Um, so it, it's not better or worse, it's a part of a strategy. 
And what someone's goal might be is that their passive income completely covers all of their expenses and gives you a little bit of buffer room as well. So if, if your monthly expenses are, I'm just going to make up a number, $5,000 a month, I mean, $2,000 passively is awesome, and $6,000 working is also great, but you have $1,000 to work with plus the $2,000 to invest. So you have $3,000 a month to invest if you've got $5,000 uh, costs. The goal is to increase your passive income to as much as you possibly can and at a minimum cover your, your expenses. At least that's the way that I do it. Another thing that's good also is if you get qualified dividends on your passive income, uh, your tax rate, if they're qualified, usually around 15% or so. Uh, sometimes if you're working, a lot of that money could be taxed at higher rates. So you could really benefit by getting a lot of passive income that's qualified and, and lower your tax rate if you're at a higher tax level. Just an FYI. And I'm not a tax specialist. I'm just giving you my experience. Uh, who else noticed that NBA Mortgage Purchase Applications Index came in at uh, 162.2 this week, which is much higher than the same week a year ago. I've been sharing how the Altos data has been predicting home sales growth for 2024. Some other data sets are now pointing that way too. This is really interesting. The Mortgage Purchase Applications Index basically bottomed in November of 23, and it's been heading higher. Um, and it looks like we've broken that downtrend line. Uh, to the upside. So maybe we are turning the corner here for mortgage purchase applications. Interesting, just very interesting. Uh, Rev says, we can live through this as a country in pain as the largest cohort demographically on the right tries to form families in the biggest housing deficit ever. Or we can find policy solutions to make it easier to add supply. Inventory is so low on the left that a small change would matter. This is our inventory that's down in no man's land. Uh, we are basically have lower inventory going all the way back to the early 1980s. Let me make sure you guys can see how low we are. Oops, I gotta go on this side. There it is. We are way down there. We are lower than even the early 80s. And then some people are like, we're in a bubble. You cannot be in a bubble if you have no inventory. That is contradictive. It doesn't, you literally cannot make sense when you say that. You, you can't be bursting at the seams of inventory when you have no inventory. And here's the demographic. Um, it's this big bulge here that's coming into home buying years. The first time uh, average home buyer age is 35, 36 years old. So we still have some years where this bulge needs to work its way through. We have another five, six years for that bulge to work its way through. That's what's coming. This here is going to be inflationary because credit is created when those homes are going to be built and purchased. And that demographic's also going to go through peak spending years uh, in their 30s and 40s. So th that's what's going to be inflationary. I've studied the housing industry as much as anyone. Home prices today are not being set by incomes. They are being set by existing net worth levels. It skews economic power towards groups with net worth. It would make the economy much more fair if there was more housing supply. Correct. 100%. And this is the nominal total net worth households and nonprofit organizations there. We've got... Higher rates can't slow the, tight, the tightest housing market ever. The proportion of home inventory, which is vacant for sale, has never been this low, even going back into the 1970s. The vacancy rate is the tightest it's ever been. Median sales price is up 4.2% year over year for 2023 at the end of the year. And I know some people are like, well, we're going to have this crash. Good luck. It's the tightest housing market we've ever seen in history. 
And I don't know why people don't understand that. This is the house price index versus owner's equivalent rent. And a lot of people look at these types of data. This is a result of the tightest market to ever exist. A bubble occurs when your inventory explodes to the upside. We're not there yet. Gary says, so I wanted to read this. Uh, it's a little bit of a read, but uh, I think it's worth reading. He says, I get the impression some people think I'm calling a top in the stock market. I'm not. Calling tops is next to impossible to do with any consistency. I'm pointing out that the market is becoming dangerous and more dangerous the longer it rallies. Totally agree there. But most traders don't think like that. They assume that if the market keeps going up, it means it will continue going up for the foreseeable future, and they become worried that they are missing out, the fear of missing out. The thought of someone else making money and not them is repugnant to most people. That thought process is what drives bubbles. Hey, everyone else is getting rich. I want to get rich too. The larger that gap becomes between price and the 200-week moving average, the more dangerous this market gets. Ironically, the larger the gap gets, the more aggressively the average unsophisticated trader will become in chasing the rally, which sets the stage for a crash when the inevitable regression to the mean be event begins. People chasing late in a runaway move is what builds all of the stops that trigger on the way down and cause a crash to occur. So no, I'm not calling a top, but I'm warning that the market is becoming dangerous and is creating the conditions for a crash when the top finally arrives. I tried to warn crypto traders that Bitcoin was becoming dangerous. Most refused to listen, and now the miners have lost 40, 50, even 60% of their value in just the last three weeks. On the other hand, the metals markets and energy markets are, are creating the conditions for huge rallies if they can stretch price too far in the downward direction or go sideways long enough to frustrate the crap out of everyone. So he's talking about market psychology in his post here. And market psychology is incredibly important to become a better investor. So what he's saying is, basically as you stretch away from this 200 day moving average up here and where we're stretching today, that's where it becomes more dangerous. The likelihood of a large pullback becomes more likely. And it's all psychology. When we look at this, everyone's piling in because they're saying, oh, it's going up. I don't want to miss out on. And they think it's going to continue forever. But as this goes up, your risk continues to go up. It becomes more and more risky to jump into it. And that's what you need to be cognizant of. Risk goes up as the price goes up. And conversely, as things go down, like you said in the energy sector, which I completely agree with, this sentiment is completely blown out in the energy sector. Nobody wants it, and it's way down, and the more it grinds sideways, the less people want it. And you have to do exactly opposite of everyone else if you want to make obscene amounts of money. You have to go where everyone else is not, and then you got to sell when everyone else wants to buy your shares. If AI is all it's supposed to be, bond yields would be dropping because AI is disinflationary. And small caps as beneficiaries would be ripping higher because of the productivity gains from the AI future. Period. End of story. The thing that I agree with is you should see it in the data if AI is so great. Now, I don't know if we're just too early for AI to have an impact on the bottom line of a lot of these companies. I don't know if they've implemented it in mass yet. But if AI is that great, we should see GDP go up. We should see the costs of all of these companies that are using AI go down. And we should see yields drop if it is disinflationary. But you got to keep in mind that AI is a function of prices uh, on the back end. It's, it's the consumer price index that, the, that we'd be measuring. And AI would Im impact the the end pricing. I don't think prices are going to go down. I think AI is going to increase the margins of businesses if, if it's going to be that great. Um, 
And it can only do that because if your margins start to expand, they will cut prices if, if they can undercut another competitor. So it, it could be slower inflation and or even deflationary depending on what products you're measuring. But on the front end where the inflation is created, uh, it's, it's money printing, it's deficit spending, it's these interest expenses that the government is just ballooning. Uh, that's the front end of it. So you've got two competing forces that are gonna enter the market at the same time. Massive fiscal deficit spending is gonna collide with AI uh, deflationary pressures. Who's gonna win? I think inflation's still gonna win. And I think the demographic coming through is gonna also create more credit in the system. And I think there's gonna be inflationary pressures uh, inherent into the uh, commodities as well. So AI is gonna basically try to offset those inflationary pressures that are coming. Uh, recession searches have now collapsed peaking in July of 2022. Back then, everyone was anticipating a recession, but now nobody is expecting one. Remember, the yield curve inversion is a reliable predictor of recessions. Based on historical lag times, a 2024 recession is very likely. At Game of Trades, our mission is to help people become successful investors by understanding markets and providing actionable strategies. Recession searches have fallen. Now, this is pretty interesting. We had recessions peak in 08. Then you had your recession here, and then they came back up again. But we also had recessions in 2020 and then 2022. So I don't know if this is actually a good, uh, reliable indicator. Kind of looks like it is. And we're declining. So maybe, maybe the recession's behind us. Maybe we already went through the slowdown. Or maybe not. <laughs> um, so here's another one. Number one. Uh, Cigar Lake is an incredible but very difficult uranium mine. A, a read through the 2016 technical re report will make this clear. Based on the original mine plan, Cigar is moving into a lower grade phase where increased ore throughput is required to maintain equivalent uranium production. This will lead to both higher costs and greater mining challenges. It is also noteworthy that phase one will end around 2028 and phase two, if sanctioned, will increase the difficulty level. The mineralization in phase one is thicker and higher grade than phase two. Camco has yet to detail a plan for phase two. It will need to be made soon. My view is the greater required ore throughput will increase the probability of unforeseen problems and the transition to phase two to mining will introduce even greater uncertainty, all leading to potential increased tightness in the uranium market. And there's the mine production that they've got projected. There's the mill production, pretty flat, all the way out to 2026. Let's hope Cam Camco can execute, but any significant production miss or extended delay would shock the already tight uranium market and there's definitely based on Camco's history, a chance of this during the upcoming period of greater mining challenges at Cigar Lake. Uh, not, not to mention that Cigar has flooded multiple times. It is a very challenging, basically to produce from this deposit. And there's a lot of risk there, I agree. Uh, do, not, do not know this, but holy crap, 45% of total GDP comes from so the size of government in Canada is roughly 45% of total GDP, tipping point within reach. That is ridiculous, guys. How do you, how do you have the government be 45% of your total GDP? That's just absolutely ridiculous. I didn't, I didn't know that either. Uh, almost 40% of U.S. homes don't have a mortgage. This is the highest level in over a decade. 40, 40%, that's pretty awesome. And um, we're continuing to increase. Uh, Jesse says, after being caught flat-footed early last year, fund managers have gone all in on technology stocks. Bubble. <laughs> yeah, this is this is looking kind of bubbleish when everybody's going all in on tech stocks, but it could keep going. I get it. Uh, if you want to blow your your mind, 
Think about this. The 5.8 trillion combined market cap of only Microsoft and Apple is 1.5 trillion more than the total value of all 225 members of the Japan's Nikkei 225 index. And at the same time, Japan has the second largest stock market in the world. So the second largest stock market in the world is smaller than Microsoft and Apple. Guys, this is ridiculous. I, I still can't believe just how big these companies are. It's like they're taking over the world. Uh, here's momentum. This is uh, Michael Oliver. He says, Twitter is a modern day open outcry pit. And it is populated by many who, who, who seem to have never lived through a business cycle. If you want to bet on a stock that is now worth more than the entire sector of the economy upon which all of civilization rests, without which it would not exist, then by all means, please chase this bubble. Maybe it will be worth more than the entire global economy next week. <laughs> Total bubble, and I agree with Michael Oliver. And then we've got URA. Uh, this is the chart when not using log. This thing looks fantastic to continue higher. It looks like a nice rounding bottom. Uh, and we've got a big, hopefully, move ahead of us for URA. Looks absolutely fantastic. Uh, and that's where I'm going to end it, guys. So that's what I've got for today. Give me a thumb up for the content. Subscribe to the channel. Uh, subscribe to the website if you haven't. And uh, we'll catch you later. This is Finding Value.